<clears throat> I do put a fresh glass here, it's not just sits there for weeks on end, fossilising. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, it's pretty good today. Thanks, Carol. I'll, I'll, I'll pay you later. <laughs> oh, dear. Who's been down to the toilets recently? It's a pleasant little wander if you need to go to the toilets. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. It's good fun. Uh, thank you to John and uh, his many helpers, Ron, Rob, Le uh, Les, Nick came down and played with concrete, I hear. Uh, fantastic. They've uh, improved the drainage outside the Sunday school room and, and down the path. So, so have a look as you go by. So thank you for that labour of love and frustration. And yes, and I'm glad I didn't have to do it. Praise the Lord. Um, yes, other people have other talents and I have other talents and God bless them. Yes, so well done. So thanks for, thanks for that. So it's good that's all got sorted. Just wanted to say that. I think there might even be a few rotten tomatoes at the back. Oh, no, probably they're, no, they're probably quite fine tomatoes. If you want to take them home, we had a few leftovers from our food baskets on Wednesday. So take the tomatoes home or whatever you see in boxes lying around that looks like fruit and veg. Please just help yourself and, and enjoy that. We're continuing in our series of Job. Uh, it's week four for us. And there's Bible studies and things happening through the week as we journey through the book of Job and sort of ask the question, hey God, what do you want to say to us uh, from the life of Job? And how can we identify with this man who suffered much and stayed faithful and persevered? So let's pray as we come and open God's word today. Lord God, I thank you that we can just spend a few moments considering your word today. Thank you for Job's life. Thank you that it can speak to our life, that you are a God in control, that you are a God who comes and stands with us in times of pain and suffering. As Christian brothers and sisters, we can come alongside and support those that are doing it tough. So Lord, today, inspire us from your word. Holy Spirit of God, come and, and speak to us. Bless us, we pray. As we hear from your word, in Jesus' name, amen. If you're taking notes uh, this morning, it's, my title is A Word About Wisdom. There's a thing called survivor's guilt. If you've ever been in a disaster, a trauma, a massacre, a car crash, a flood, a cyclone, there's a thing that happens called survivor's guilt. I remember many years ago in Mackay there was a large flood and we had a thousand odd people outside our church. And every afternoon at about six o'clock I could go home to my nice dry house and my family and, and they were all there quite fine and we were quite fine. But day in day out for a three week period we helped and cared for people who were basically standing with the clothes upon their back. And, and, and there's this unusual sort of sense, well, I'm okay, and, and, but so many weren't. And I can list off the streets and I can tell you what was flooded and, and things that people lost. And, and so there's this interesting feeling at times when we maybe have survived and others had not. Or it wasn't as bad for me, but it was worse for you. Why does tragedy choose one and, and not the other? Why are people chosen and treated differently? A catastrophe comes and treats people differently. It doesn't take the bad and leave the good, nor does it take the good and leave the bad. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 8, verse 14, we read these words. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve and the wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. And from Ecclesiastes 9, 2 and 3, all share a common destiny. The righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good man, so with the sinner. As it is with those who take oaths and, and with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil in... This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes 
all. As we consider the book of Job and his life, there's some important, though they are a couple of important observations. You remember that Job is a righteous man. There's no one like him on the face of the earth. He fears God, he shuns evil. Job was very rich and prosperous, and yet suffered horrifically. His children were gone, his wealth is gone, his home is gone, his health is gone, he's lost his wife's respect, he's struggling. Friends, we know why Job is suffering. It's not because he has sinned. It's because in heaven, Satan slandered Job and Satan slandered God as well. And Satan comes and says, have you observed Job? He's only okay because of what God has given him. And God wants to prove Satan wrong. So God allows Satan twice to test Job. God sets the limits each time. But Job knows that God is in control. Job knows that God has allowed this disaster to come to him. But he doesn't know why. Job only knows that disaster has come. But it hasn't come because of something he has done wrong or his sin. We've heard what his friends think. They believe that he is suffering because it must be some secret sin or something that he's done. Or maybe God has sent this punishment upon him so he can suffer. But we know they are horribly wrong and terribly mistaken. And Job remains faithful and strong in the midst of suffering. And Job knows enough to know that his friends are wrong. That God is up to something. And that's okay. And so he wrestles with God. Like Jacob and Israel wrestled and struggled with God. There doesn't seem to be any pattern to this suffering. At least it's not obvious to us from an earthly perspective. Sometimes the wicked get what they deserve and we go, yes! Oh, maybe we don't. <laughs> and sometimes the righteous receive the same outcome. And we go, that's just not fair. So we come to this chapter 28. It gives us a bit of a, ah, finally, a bit of a rest, a bit of a break. It doesn't seem to fit. Job's final reply to his friends and in the midst of that, it doesn't seem to fit with what Job has been saying up until now. Job seems to have some, some sort of new in insight. He emerges from all this wrestling and sorrow with a, with a new perspective and a, and a bit of hope. Maybe the endorphins and the adrenaline has kicked in after all the pain and suffering. And there comes some insight into this problem and, and some acceptance of this situation. And some information of how we should live faithfully and wisely. Job is in the zone and in the moment. His performance is elevated. Those endorphins have kicked in and Job speaks with great wisdom and with some clarity and some insight for us in Job chapter 28. We're going to have a little dive into that chapter, verses 1 to 11 of 28. <coughs> Excuse me. There is a mine for silver and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Models put an end to the darkness. They search out the farthest recesses 
for all of in the black in the blackest darkness. This all sounds a bit interesting, doesn't it? Far from human dwellings, they cut a shaft in places untouched by human feet. Far from other people, they dangle and sway the earth. The earth from which food comes is transformed below by fire. Lapis and loot, well, however that is, lovely precious stones, come from its rocks and its dust contains nuggets of gold. No birds of prey knows the hidden path. No falcon's eyes have seen it. Proud beasts do not set a foot on it, and no lion prowls there. People assault the flinty rock with their hands and lay bare the roots of the mountains. They tunnel through the rock. Their eyes see all its treasures. They search the sources of the rivers and bring hidden things to light. So there we have a picture of Mining going on and shafts being built and rocks and gold and, and precious stones and all these wonderful things we like to get out of the ground. In Australia, we love to dig out stuff, amen? Gold and coal and ore and aluminium and uranium and, and all these wonderful things. The other night, we popped Dad, uh, my father, on a plane and a plane got in from Mackay and there they all were coming off in their lovely high-vis stuff and I'm thinking, yep. Coal production is pretty safe, I think, and, and they were very busy coming off the coming off the plane from Mackay. We love to dig out stuff. We're the second largest exporter of gold and uranium, the third largest exporter of aluminium, one of the largest exporters still of coal around the world. Job here in this passage raises two interesting points. First, people endanger themselves to find gems and precious metals. But they don't even look for wisdom. But they're willing to dig out from the ground these precious things. Men don't see the value of understanding God and His ways, but they spend lots of time digging stuff up from the earth that they perceive as precious and beautiful. Verses 12 and 11 of 28. But... Where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? Man does not comprehend its worth. It cannot be found in the land of the living. And secondly, no matter how far you dig, you won't find wisdom. Digging for wisdom, Job says, is fruitless. Job should know. He's been driven to dig for wisdom quite a bit. And his conclusion is, you will not find it. You don't know why God distributes suffering the way he does. It cannot be found, it cannot be bought. Job has no answer why God distributes suffering the way he does. Sometimes the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper. Sometimes the righteous prosper and the wicked suffer. Sometimes righteous and wicked prosper and suffer side by side. Sometimes they die side by side. Sometimes they live and do well side by side. Anyone encouraged today? In the midst of his pain, he lifts his eyes from the earth to heaven. He trusts God. That God knows the answer and that is okay. Job has not been given an answer. But that doesn't mean that there is no that there isn't an answer. And Job is sort of coming to terms that it is okay. That God knows what he's up to. And over these weeks, if there's nothing that you get apart from that, that God knows what he's up to. And sometimes he let us know and sometimes he doesn't and we need to be okay with that because guess what? He's God. And I'm alright with that. Job 28, 23. God understands the way to it and he alone knows where wisdom dwells. Job 28, 27 and 28. 
Then he looked at wisdom and appraised it. He confirmed it and he tested it. And he said to the human race, The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to shun evil is understanding. There we go. Job can live with not being told the whole story. Job can live without knowing the answer because he knows God and remains faithful to him. Knowing God means you don't have to know everything that God knows. The fact that God knows is enough. Because God is good and just and right. And God knows everything. That if God has not told me something, friends, I believe he has a good reason. And for us in our quick fix, need to know it, need to have it in our world, that's very hard to sit with. I don't know why God has given the uneven distribution of suffering, but God does. Maybe now is not the time to know. Maybe now is the time to trust God in the midst of a sinful world, in the midst of a difficult situation. Hey, I'm leaving it with you, God, and that's okay. We don't know everything about Jesus. And I think we would say we're okay with that. John reminds us in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, that Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. We okay with that? Hope so. But what is there has a purpose and a meaning to transform lives. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. What's there is supposed to be there so that we will find Jesus, our hope and our Saviour. The other day I was in line at the ATM. In front of me was a little old lady. She was clearly having trouble with this newfangled technology and where to put a card and where to put the numbers in. Anyone? Okay, just tap and go, ladies and gentlemen. It's the future. Get it on your phone. Get it on your watch. Just. She said, excuse me, can you help me? I'm having a bit of trouble. I need to check my account balance. So I gave her a push. <laughs> You'll get it when you get home. Yes. I need to check my balance, so I gave her a push. Get up. Oh, okay, yes. We'll go, we'll go again. That's right. That's right. Yes. You only get one bite of the cherry. Uh. And what is the wisdom of God for us today? We know more than just to fear God. We know good and bad happens. We know he has hopes and plans and purposes for us. We know the message of the cross. We see Job suffering and struggling. And at times in our lives we've suffered and we've struggled. And we've wondered, hey God, what's it all about? In Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, from verse 18, we read these words. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who perish. But to us who are being saved is the power of God. For it is written, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise, the, inter the intelligence of the intellect, I will frustrate where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. 
Jews demand a sign and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those in whom God has called, both Greeks and Jews, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For we have discovered that it's okay that God knows. And we have discovered the message and ministry of Jesus Christ and we have embraced that as his church. And we will suffer and we will struggle and we will, there will be tears and pains and disappointments. And sometimes we just need to leave it with God and thank you God that I woke up breathing this morning. And the book of Job resolves around, resolves around the one idea that if we want to live life to the full, it's not a matter of knowing why things happen. Instead, it's a matter of knowing that God knows why things happen and I'm putting my trust in the God who knows. God bless you. Amen.